Welcome to Dentology, the Business of Dentistry podcast. In this podcast, we delve into the non-clinical aspects of dentistry with inspirational guests from across the profession. You will hear incredible life stories, pick up valuable business tips and be entertained. I'm Andy Acton and I'm joined by my co-host, Chris Drevens. PR is a fascinating world when you go back to the early days of how analogue it was to generate <laughs> content. <laughs> you, I, mean, I tell you what, talking to Fianna, it made me realise that, or, or just made me think, we are so used to like Google and all that mm. stuff. Before then, you would have, it would have taken so much to research, mm. such a harder job. You know, when, when she talked about not having a mobile phone and mm. having to go to a phone box, I mean, yeah. that's like old school. But really, really I just really think there's real learnings in there for how to communicate with patients, accepting that not everybody really wants to be interviewed or on camera. So if you're looking to generate patient testimonials, you yeah. need to tread carefully. Um, that kind of tenacity. And resilience. Yeah. You have to ask. If you don't ask, you don't get yeah. it. I think that's but a also that take away how from me. to get yourself in the media. Mm. Um, and I genuinely think, I think the Magic Dentist yeah, as a definitely. campaign, which she, she talks about, I will put a link in the And everybody the should get notes. involved with that, really, because yeah. it is a, it's a community thing, but dental health and especially for children. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, no, it was a really good episode. A great episode. Hello, hello. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thank you very much. How's you doing? Very good, very good. Before we start, I um, want to share something. So Feedspot put out a, um, oh, I've seen a this. list of the most popular podcasts. I should have a T-shirt on. I'm ready. And and get this, out of the UK dental podcast, Dentology ranked number one whoop, by whoop. traffic, social media following, and freshness. 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 Imagine being ranked hey. number one for freshness. Oh, lovely. Nothing like a bit of freshness. <laughs> Absolutely superb. I can smell that freshness from here, Andrew. Yeah. So we hope more people listen and we hope more people subscribe because that would be absolutely wonderful. Yeah, anyway, one. today's episode, we're very fortunate. Uh, we're joined by Fiona Dwyer. And Fiona uh, is a PR consultant and coach, but in a former life was also an ITV journalist and senior reporter. Excellent. Which is going to be fascinating. Excellent. I must admit, when I first saw her, I did sort of vaguely think, oh, I might have recognised you from something. Well, so, let's, uh, yeah, let's, so. let's, let's, let's find out more about you. Welcome, yeah. Fiona. How are you doing? Hello, I'm very well, thank you, and congratulations on being number one. I hope you've written a press release or at least got it out on all your social media already. We have. <laughs> we have. We have. <laughs> yes, we've, we've, we're, we're very good at blowing our own trumpet on this. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> well done. <laughs> so um, to start with, um, you've had an extraordinary career, which, which we're going to kind of get to. But before we get to that, quite often there's clues to who we become from our childhood. So is there a time you can look back on your childhood and say, that's why I'm the person I am today? Um, wow, that's a hard one. I don't know. I, <laughs> yeah. comp- I do. Nobody in my family does what I do. So oh, wow. I'm I'm the youngest of seven children. Um, seven. We're, seven, one of seven. Yes. Wow. Yeah, and we're all sort of born in eight years. We're um, Irish Catholic, so my parents um, met oh, over here actually. But, um, oh, they were born they were, within eight years. They were both uh, they were both Irish, and they came over here. They met over here as well, and so um, we were all born in England. So. In the West Midlands, we were brought up in Walsall in the West Midlands. Oh, yep. Yeah. And um, so we support Walsall Football Club, by the way. Right. <laughs> um, just putting <laughs> it out there. So, um, so, uh, but, so my dad was a doctor, my mum was a nurse. Um, my, my siblings, I'm, I'm the youngest, my siblings were either um, went into sort of nursing or mm. accountancy. It was more sort of project management. I'm the only one who went into journalism. So I'm not quite sure... Um, where that came from I just always wanted to read the news I sort of would see people reading <laughs> I just wanted I used to what I used to see people um BBC Midlands today it was I used to see them um, um reading the news and I, I sort of thought oh I could do that and I thought how do I get to do that and it's oh it's by being a journalist so I thought right I want to be a journalist so that's kind of how I went about it did you but bizarrely sorry just a very funny story which I probably shouldn't tell you um but there is a thing keep going me. keep going there is a photograph of me um, when I was literally tiny tot um, sitting on the potty reading the newspaper. Ah, <laughs> so I think oh, it was meant to be. <laughs> Brilliant. That's what I was going to ask was my children, uh, my daughters especially, uh, when they were younger, we had so many 
dance performances and stuff. And I was thinking, were you that sort of little girl who would sit there and just pretend to read the news? You'd get a little little paper with a you know a little desk with some papers, knock them down, and and do stuff like that. And by the sounds of things, possibly because you were reading the newspaper already when you. Were I think reporting. I just read the newspaper, but I don't even know if I knew what I was reading at the time. But I was there. There is literally a picture of me reading the newspaper, and I can only have been what eighteen months mm. or two. Really? I don't know wow. what it was. So, uh, so that's. Was quite it upside an down? <laughs> no, it was the right way up. Yeah, I'm impressed. impressed. Look at that. So you, you've had you've had a decent spell of time in in the media industry. How? How did you get into it? I was going to say, when did you start? And, and what was it like back then? Because, you know, now people see media very much in a digital frame, whereas with you it would have been very analog. So, yeah, how did you get into that and what did it look like back then? Well, um, I went – they didn't do journalism degrees when I went uh, – when I did my degree. So I started my degree in 1987 and I went to um, Trinity and All Saints in Leeds, which is now called Trinity – university but at that time it was college it was in the time of unis polys and colleges right. um, but I chose that degree because it was a joint honours it was well I started it I did a year of French and public media then I swapped to English and public media but in the public media side there was an option to do there was a journalist journalism option um, as well as a marketing option a public relations option and what have you and that was mm-hmm. the closest I could get to doing something in journalism but the great thing about the course was that every year you had to do six weeks work experience. Oh, and I wow. thought that was brilliant because that meant mm. I would have to work in the media somewhere and it would go on my CV. Mm. So I had it sort of planned out in my head that this is what I was going to do and I would get, you know, work experience so that I'd have all this, you know, I'd get contacts and what have mm-hmm. you in the media so that I could progress. And so um, my first um, so my first bylines actually were from my work experience was on the, the newspaper back at home, the Warsaw Advertiser. It was the weekly free newspaper. Uh, right, and yeah. um, so that was my, uh, so that was the byline. So by Fiona Dwyer, um, if for anyone who doesn't know what a byline uh, I was going to ask you what a byline meant. And that, oh, yes, I see. Right. Literally, okay. It just means that you've got a by with your name after it. Oh, cool. um, so, so they were my first bylines, uh, which was amazing. And that was also my first celebrity interview um, and it was with Brenda Blethyn, who oh, was oh, yeah. the actress, yes. who um, was playing at Wolverhampton Grand Theatre. And uh, but I ne- never actually met her. It was a phone interview. Oh. So, but she was so lovely, and I was I was thinking, oh my god, she thinks I'm a real journalist, uh, and uh, and I wasn't. I, I, well, and I, I was being a journalist. I wasn't qualified. At she that was time. probably on the other end of the phone call, going, "I bet she thinks I'm a real actor." <laughs> <laughs> Everybody I, has I, it. I piece and I got a byline, so I was absolutely over the moon, and I was like, "I've interviewed Brenda Blethyn." So, uh, so yeah, so that was that was really Did you cool. Keep that original one. Have you got like the have, original I've, one? I've got a file. Yeah, oh, brilliant. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brilliant. so no, that's good. But uh, but then my next one was I worked at BBC Radio Leeds, so in program. So that was my first radio experience as well. And my first time um, going down to do a Vox Pop uh, into Leeds, I had to walk down into Leeds city centre. And uh, in, in those days, you used, it was called a ewer, a ewer machine. And it was it was literally your tape. So you recorded on tape because then you'd have to splice and you know, oh, right. stick okay. the tape together when you were doing it. It wasn't just in and out edit. It was actual tape. So... Um, so you'd carry it on your shoulder. It was like a big like heavy bag thing. And you'd go with your microphone and you'd have to stop people in the street and li- and ask them a question to do a Vox Pop. Um, so I can't remember what the Vox Pop was about now. But I thought, I thought I was terrified because I thought hey, no one's going to want to talk to me. How do mm. I actually stop somebody in, you know, yeah. in, in the shopping centre and say, I'm, I'm working for it. Well, and I just did. And I just, I, I just assumed confidence. And I just thought... Um, they all think that I have this confidence because mm. I'm working on the radio mm. and they won't think anything of it if I just interrupt them interrupt them walking down the street and say, excuse me, you know, yeah. I'm from Radio Leeds. Can you just, you know, tell me about X, Y, Z? So yeah. that was that was how I how I got my and, work. And did most people say yes on that experience? No. Or were there some people said, <laughs> oh, really? Nobody does in general for box pops. It's oh, like, really? They no, just I'm keep walking. Busy. No, I've got to get back to work. No, but, 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 but interestingly, Fiona, I wonder whether mm. today, with the advent of social media and people endlessly taking pictures and reels and stories and filming themselves, if you went out today into a busy shopping street with a microphone, I think it'd be quite different. I think people would be way keener to to engage. Mm, not really. If, really. Depending on what, yes. I mean, I I only left um, ITV because I worked at um, Yorkshire Television, ITV mm. Yorkshire. So what would have been Yorkshire Television? Mm. Um, and 
I, uh, but even I only left completely um, two and a half, nearly three years ago. And so when we were doing Vox Pops then, um, people would still walk past you. They'd be rushing past. They didn't want to be really? on television. They'd rather die than be on television. They would. <laughs> I, thought um, would have, I thought it would I have changed. I suppose people are still people, aren't they? I suppose. Yeah. And, and no, they just didn't want to. They didn't want to say anything, or they, or, or some people would stop, and then they'd say, "Well, what are you wanting to talk about?" And then, then they'd start. They'd be having a chat, and then they said, "Can, can we record this? You know, because you have to ask permission mm, yeah. um, if they're going to be on camera." And then they say, "Oh no, I don't want to be on telly." And I'm like, "Going well, why do you think?" <laughs> Having a conversation with me, yeah. I'm on a deadline. Come on. It's a, it's a great sales, though, isn't it? I mean, it's the classic sales. Um, you have to keep, go- keep going, keep yeah. asking. Otherwise, if you'd have been knocked down after the first five, you'd have gone back and mm. probably never done it again. Yeah, sometimes. That's a brilliant lesson to just resilience, isn't it? Yes, it is. I think sometimes you just have to – sometimes you're really lucky and you get the people that you need straight away. Mm. Um, mm. Because you go you go out with the idea, right, I need this number of people to say something. And yeah. you want to get um, opposing views because you don't want, unless every everybody, if, if it's a question, everyone is overwhelmingly in favour mm. or against or whatever. But you want to try and get um, a whole mixture of views so that mm. you get, um, so that your report is balanced. Mm. I'd be, mm. I'd be, it'd be great to know what the first one was, wasn't it? If you could remember what it was. I know. Right? I was it about, you know. Things. Yeah. <laughs> Can't remember. Well, I suppose it, you just don't think about it. Yeah. No. You must have done so many, I suppose. They sort of like, I, I, I just think yeah. it's an interesting one when someone shoves a microphone in your face. Ooh. Oh, yeah. And, and as, an, as an industry, I recently watched um, The Morning Show with Jennifer Aniston and Ruth Witherspoon on, on Apple TV. It's brutal. It looks like a brutal industry. Is, is that kind of what it's like? Is it as harsh and as, as brutal as that? Or is it depicted? like Anchorman? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or drop the dead donkey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was um, good. Uh, it it can be, but you have you have to be on the ball. You have to be. Um, um, we were quite lucky where we were because we were all sort of like a, a sort of family, really, at Calendar News where I worked, uh, and we all um, looked out for each other. But but yes, we all we all wanted to. You know, it was all it was great if you had the top story. Um, mm. But you you need to sort of help and support each other along the way. It can be brutal. It can be um, you have to accept that if if somebody's on deadline, you can't interrupt someone. You have to have a th- quite a thick skin in the sense mm. that if you're if you need some information or if somebody comes to you, because I'm a really polite person, and if somebody and if I'm on deadline and I'm writing something and I and I haven't got or I'm editing and I and I haven't got time, I'm literally I've got five minutes to go. Mm or 10 minutes to go and someone's trying to talk to you you're kind of like you know i can't talk to you go mm. away do you know what i mean and mm. you have to literally be can't talk to you <laughs> so it, you might seem rude but you're not really being rude and everybody well, understands it's an interesting one who we had i can't remember who was the guest that we had who had that phone person of the in the trade towers or something there Twin trade towers. Oh, was that an interview I was watching? And someone was saying, you know, they were, it was the first time they were interviewing someone and then they just happened to have this phone number of this person who'd been in the bombing and then they just kept ringing him. <laughs> and they said that it was really awkward in the fact, but they said somehow you sort of, a bit like you're saying on the rudeness, they just sort of blocked out any of that personal stuff because they just had a story that they wanted to get and get delivered and out. Uh, it's fascinating. Mm. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And over the years, you've got to interview some quite remarkable people, haven't you? Dame Judi Dench, John Hurt. Yeah, and I mean, they what, were what, just what was that like? really brilliant, actually. Um, they were as they, they came to our region because they were getting honorary honorary degrees. It's a hard word to say, honorary, honorary, deg- <laughs> honorary degrees. Um, and uh, so I they were in my patch. So I, I was a reporter for this area. So um, so I got to do their interviews. And I think, but the most important thing, I always research them beforehand as well. Mm-hmm. So I had, you know, good stuff to ask mm. them about. And it wasn't just about, so, so, but they were so gracious. And when you, when you sort of see them, you sort of think, oh, I hope they're really nice people. Mm. And they actually were. Mm, and nice. I remember with Dame Judy, she, um, the, the camera wasn't working or something with the cat. So the character, so she just had to wait a little bit. And, and I was, I was really apologetic. I'm saying, I'm so sorry. We were, Cause she had a whole line of people who were going yeah. to interview her. So I'm so sorry. We'll get this technical issue. sorted. And she was going, don't worry about it. It's absolutely fine. So it was just That's really nice. nice 
that oh. she was so nice. Was that um, pre-Google days or were you able to Google research? I'm just thinking you, you must have been at a I time when your Apple. research was just looking through lots of bits of paper and stuff like that. Oh, at that time we were Googling and my goodness, what a difference that makes. Mm. But yes, um, when I first started, it was you just had to have the information that was sent to you or you'd be um, looking, uh, you would have, you know, you'd get researchers to look or you would... Um, it was just what you knew already. You mm. kind of just had to sort of, you know, find out. Or if you had time, which often you don't have time, um, oh, right. I guess you would have gone to the library. Usually, you just you'd have you'd, have, yeah. you'd ring somebody in the library to ask them. Wow. Um, and it was also um, it was we didn't when I first very first started we didn't even have mobile phones in the in in the early in the nineties. Wow. We didn't really have mobile phones, so. Um, so if you were out on a story, you always had to, wherever you were, um, um, you could be, you know, an hour and a half away from base. But whenever you finish, you would always ring the news desk before you left in case a story had, uh, you'd have to you'd find a phone box, you know. I was going to say, did you have to have like coins or something, like a, yeah, a coins, bag full of coins? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. So you would phone the news desk just to make sure that nothing had happened and nothing, no story had broken around you so that you mm. needed to be diverted before wow. you got back with the story that you were on. Wow. So um, that was wow. it. I'm really showing my age, but that's really... <laughs> But it'd be really interesting for, I think, for our listeners that, you know, I, I sort of, I don't know what our demographic is, but you sort of think they're probably young, mid, mid thirties, maybe. And, and one, they probably don't remember a world really probably without Google and researching and Wikipedia, even though what it is. And, and definitely probably will never, ever have used a phone box. <laughs> and, uh, it makes you think, you remember working. those, do you remember those um, telephone directives? Oh, yeah, it's a, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's like a whole different world, isn't it? Yeah, and if you found a phone box and it wasn't working, <laughs> you had to find another phone box. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want, you know, one that hadn't been vandalised or something. So, well, uh, for, so, for yeah, so, so that was it. But also, um, if you had time to research, if you knew there was a story coming up that you were going to do or it was a particular um, issue that you were researching, you'd go to the library and you'd go through the microfiches. Do you, right, yeah. do you remember? Do you know, a microfiche, yeah. Remember that? So you'd Absolutely. literally go through and scan all the old newspaper articles and, and wow. things like that. We used to have those in the bank and in the library, yeah. I seem to remember. Yeah. I think it's incredible yeah, in where we are now in terms of wow. research tools that are available to us. It's become so much quicker. Okay. I think the only challenge with it is that now um, you can't necessarily directly trust the source. Because back in the day when you were researching against published documents, you, you hoped there was kind of a process that went through to get published. So there was a, a degree of kind of you know, truth yeah, with it. As opposed to Whereas Wikipedia. Now, well, now, yeah, I mean, people Google things and they get what they believe is a fact or the truth. But there, there isn't really any filter of, of what gets uploaded. So whilst in one hand it's easier to get information, it still needs to be cross-checked cross -checked and validated somehow. So, Very so. much so. You have to double check it against the source, and you know it's it's good to sort of get you know three sources saying the same thing, and then mm. you know that you know for sure that it's happened. Or if there's if there's like a a, a statistic saying seventy eight percent of people do such and such, and you know where's that actually come from, and you have to go back to the actual mm. yeah, yeah. Um, study so that so, you can actually only 10 study people. yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so between us on this podcast, who was your best interview? Between you two. Yeah. No, no, not us. On the your best interview <laughs> ever. I know, I know you mean. Yeah, choose. Make a decision. <laughs> that, 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 that'll make it really awkward next 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when you say Chris and I'm sitting there like... Yeah, sod off. <laughs> yeah, no, so um, what's your best interview? Um, my fav Well, my favourite interview... Favourite? Yeah, go. My favourite interview was actually, I think, with John Hurt. When I, oh. I mean, I've interviewed lots of people, but when I think about it, just because... He was he was so lovely. Do you know Do you know John Hurd? Mm, so yeah, he he yeah. he did amazing stuff through his career. But I because I'd researched it, I'd gone back to his um, uh, some of his early stuff. I can't now that I'm talking to you, I can't remember the name of the film. He was but Elephant he, Man, he, wasn't he? Yes. No, he he did one before that, and he portrayed a gay man in it. And oh, he was um and it was um and I I went back to that and I was asking what what that was sort of like in those times. Mm. And but all the way up to the present day, at that time when he played he played Mr. Ollivander in Harry Potter, yes. oh, and he yeah. only took that role because his grandchildren said you've got to be in Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> that was very so, sweet. sweet. Yeah, so I I sort of went and 
it was it was it was really good because he I think he enjoyed looking at the past as well mm. as you know mm. looking at the and just it was kind of amusing to him to I think that he'd gone into Harry Potter as Mr. Ollivander because his grandchildren John his grandchildren Hurt was alien, would have spoken to him again yeah. if uh, he hadn't play, played yeah. the role. Oh, he's an amazing actor. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. he's, he's, he's done so much stuff. But again, I, 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 such a nice man, and I think yeah. you find the real greats. Are, yeah. are, are really lovely. Yes, yes, which yes. is nice to hear. Are yeah. some a little bit grumpy? You don't have to mention any names. Um, some people can be grumpy, but often it's, I don't know, sometimes it's people on the way up and they sometimes think, right. I think ah, perhaps really, they... Almost ideas uh, above their station, for want to better choice. Yes. Um, but, you know, one or two, but in general, people are very nice and mm. very happy to mm. be interviewed because it's good for them at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah, absolutely. it's good PR, absolutely. isn't it? Mm-hmm. We've, we, we've established that, to be a good journalist, you need to be good at research. Mm-hmm. Um, you also need to be tenacious to make sure yes. that you get your interviews. Are there any other kind of general guiding principles that you learn through your journalism career that are just good life lessons for people that kind of has set you up well for your future career because of the things you <laughs> learn as a, as a result of your work? Yeah. Don't drink um, too much coffee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, make a good cup of tea. I'm good at making tea, though, because I used to make a lot of tea in my house. <laughs> a lot of people. I was going to say, um, with so many siblings, yeah. Yes. Um, but I I think a, you have to be tenacious. You have to, but also you have to be a decent person, I think. Mm. Um, I've always um, been polite. I've always been um, nice to people because I always think that if you're nice to people at all times, everybody's mm. a everybody's a human being and everyone demand you know deserves respect so i've always been nice to people so even when i was being tenacious and follow up i would do it in a polite way mm-hmm. so you know even in on sort of big stories very difficult stories you know when you know trying to speak to people when um family members have died in tragic circumstances mm-hmm. for instance mm-hmm. there's just a way of doing that and an empathy that you have towards them so that you you let them it's all about Asking the question and letting people speak, mm. not interrupting them and um, allowing them to uh, tell their story. And if they pause, letting them pause. Mm. Um, if they're obviously needing a prompt, then you carry on, but allowing them to tell their mm. story without you interrupting. I think that's a really good point for dentists to hear as well. Because I think quite often, and this, this happens a lot in the world over, people kind of jump in. Um, with what they think is a solution a little bit early. And I think particularly (laughs) with patients, when they're talking about their situation and perhaps what bothers them or um, issues they've had in the past or a future event that might be coming up that might be influencing why they're wanting treatment, like a wedding or a a big birthday or something like that. And I think you're right. I think staying quiet and getting people to tell their whole story. And quite often the real gold comes quite late on when they're talking because the things come out that aren't, obvious and if you just stay quiet it creates a space for them to to talk yeah and i think also before you even start an interview before you even press record just um allowing them to relax so ha- just mm. having a chat with mm. them mm. telling them what's going to be happening so that they're not um you know because they'll be Freaking worried about out, yeah. it mm. um just and just you know having a cup of tea having a you know just having it if you've got if you've got the time yeah. to do that then then that's what you've got to do. But you do learn to, to do that quite well. Were there some stories that you found really hard in the fact of, because you've almost got to put, a, I would imagine, in some very emotional stories, you sort of almost got to put a mask on to, uh, it, it, was there some stories that you just thought, well, actually, these are really awful stories and it's really hard work for you rather than just asking questions to not sort of get caught up in the emotion, really? Yeah, I mean, certainly, usually when it involved tragic death. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, stories I remember interviewing, um, and it was it was set up. They they had agreed to do the story because some people ask, why on earth are you interviewing them? How awful for the family! But I remember interviewing a father, and uh, and he had two little girls, and they'd been in a uh, an accident, and the his his wife, uh, the mother of the girls, and the, his two little boys had died. So oh. their family had been split in two wow. and so that was a very difficult interview mm. and I don't know how they did it let alone how yeah. he did it let alone but he wanted to get the message out you know and he wanted to talk about them and sometimes people find it quite um comforting to talk to to about right. it it's a cathartic. sort of cathartic almost yeah mm. yeah very much so mm. um also um I remember 
one one I found quite difficult. It was after I'd had my uh, my first child. I've got two children um, that I've had myself. Um, I've also got a stepdaughter who's older. Right. But um, my, my 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 first child um, was um, I'd gone back to work after six months, and my very first day, he was only six months old, so he literally just got into nursery, and my. First job, first day back was uh, had to go to Hall Crown Court to cover a trial about a baby who had been stabbed by um, their older brother, okay. who was like a sort of 11-ish, something like that. And all the pictures were, or you saw all the pictures that were being shown to the jury. And you sort of, and every time they were talking about it, I was thinking, because this baby was six, had, was six oh, months wow. old, the baby survived. Right. You know, so the baby was alive. Mm. Um, thankfully, I don't know how. But all I could think of every time I was thinking, oh, gosh, that's that's my son. Do you know what oh, I mean? Wow. That's yeah, what yeah. I was thinking. That emotional it, connection. <laughs> yeah, and it was and it was the first day back and it was, I had to do this this package all about it. It was the first day of the trial. And then I was doing a live at lunchtime, live into the, live, it was the lead at, at tea time. And I was doing live outside court, and it was kind of like welcome, welcome back, Fiona. welcome back, <laughs> <laughs> maternity leave, welcome yeah. back. No, no soft, no soft landing. Baptism of fire. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think they they were they things like that were the, were the mm. most difficult I mm. found. And now, now you provide PR services to your clients, which is I a, do a, effectively free marketing. That's where how, how I see PR. Yeah, um, for sure. When talking about PR. Um, is there a certain personality type or client that it works better for? Is it because I guess you're, you're talking about kind of you know helping the clients get better known? Is that is that not easy for some of your clients? It's not, and also, well, for several reasons, I think. Um, sometimes people just don't feel uncomfortable putting themselves out there. Mm. They they worry what people will say. They worry people sort of think they're a bit uppity. You know, who do they think they are trying mm -hmm. to get themselves all this press in the media? Yeah. Um, some people don't know how to um, work out what a story is to identify a story. Right. What would be interesting to a journalist? Um, a lot of people, when I start when I start talking to to clients right at the very beginning, they uh, they start telling me things, and I'm saying, "Oh, that would make a really good story." And that really, I think that you know, I'm like, yeah, that would be a story, and that would be a story, and things that they say. Mm they think they would like to that they would like me to do as a story they're not stories at all that would be interesting from a news point of view so i just have to say to them no that's that's not interesting that's um, an interesting point if, isn't it? if we add but it could if we turn it around this way or if we add statistics to it or if we add a case study to it then we can make it into a story so it's just knowing how mm. to do that when, when you say mm. people come to you and they think they've got a story Mm. Oh, effectively, are they just trying to promote their product or service? And it, it's kind of like an advert. They're not really adding any value to the reader or the listener. Exactly that. Right. They don't think about who they're actually targeting. So it's really mm. important to know who you're targeting, so who, who your audience is. Mm. And who your audience is, but also if you want to attract a particular journalist or a particular publication or radio programme or broadcast um, TV news, then you have to know the types of story that they do and that they mm. write. And you have to understand who their readers, listeners, viewers are. Mm. Because if it doesn't speak to them, then they're not going to be interesting, interested mm. because they're in they're in the business of selling newspapers or getting more viewers. Or mm. more that's, viewers. So that's, that's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because then I hadn't realised that almost it's a bit like, um, so we have a finance company. Right? Sort of, there is a sort of a bleak link here. Um, but they know which banks will lend for certain things and have a preference for things and a dislike for things. And that is that what you're sort of saying? That there'll be some some publications and the art is actually knowing who to go to because this for them is something they'd be interested in. Whereas if you took it to someone else, they'd go, oh, I'm not interested in that at all. Yeah, no, very much so. Wow. So you need you need to target the right people. So for dentists, for instance, they would be talking looking at um, you know, health reporters. Or they might be, uh, it might be looking at social affairs re reporters if it was mm. talking about, um, you know, the state of oral health or, you know, it mm. depends on what the story is. Mm. It depends on what the story is as to which journalist you would approach yeah. at uh, any given place. And also, I guess it depends whether you're generating the PR as in providing the content and the material into media or you're responding. 
because many, many years ago, I was fortunate to do some media training with a guy from Channel 4 back in like the mid, late 90s. And he always said that if somebody picks up the phone or wants to talk to you, you have to take the call because if you say no, they'll go to somebody else. And in in dentistry, there's a couple of guys who do this really well. So Kunal Patel, who owns a group Love Teeth and Nilesh Palmer, they're both great. And recently there was um, an acid attack in London and Kunal got himself all over the radio because he basically just gave some some advice on if what to do if there's an acid attack or an alkaline attack and explain the difference. But it's because he was available and he was able to move so quickly that he got all the coverage. And so d- does it kind of spit out, does it still spit out into two ways of responding to the media, but also pushing content their way as well? Yeah, it has to be both. But definitely, if somebody calls you, be available because they will go elsewhere, mm. but they won't necessarily come back to you again. Yeah. Mm. So you want them, you want to be the go-to person. So you want them to come back to you because you've got, you're media friendly and that you've got interesting mm. stuff to say mm. um, and that you're knowledgeable and that you're an expert in your mm. particular mm-hmm. area. So do you have a little black book? Do I have a black book? Yeah. yeah. I have a contact have, book. Have your little contacts that go, right, actually, yeah. this is someone I know. Contacts books are uh, gold dust for I say it must be invaluable. Yes. So you add to it all the time. Yeah. So, mm. um, so yes, so you have a, you have, although now it seems it's all transferred into your contacts on your phone. But yes, we... <laughs> Have a little yeah. black phone. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, contacts books were absolute gold just because they, they were all the people that you have ever interviewed or you might want to interview. Um, mm. and oh, wow. So you could go back to them. Um, so have you kept a catalogue then of everything you've done since you started? If you, uh, in, your, in your contacts book, if you've written, if you've spoken to somebody, then um, if it was from a particular organisation, they, they would be under, in your contacts book, under a, a particular sector. So if another environmental story came up, for instance, You'd know or another right. health story came up, you would see who have I spoken to before, who could give wow. a broad, right, yeah. Uh, you know, a broad look at it, yeah. you know, a, a sort of an expert viewpoint on mm. this. So, um, so yeah. That so keeping that's data, back. yeah. It's so another important. sort of business thing, isn't yeah, it? The fact yeah, of yeah. keeping that data because you never know when it's going to be useful. When you want to go back. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. You, yeah. you were saying if you own about um, people coming up with like, ideas that's, that aren't newsworthy, uh, have you got some tips for things that are newsworthy? Is there people out there saying, well, I'm not entirely sure what, what I would have as a, as a dental practice that might be newsy? What are the, the sort of things that the media might might pick up? Or some really bad in? ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, well, a really bad idea would be to say I've got um, I've got a ten percent off on or twenty percent off on something because that's clearly an advert, hmm. and so they're not going to be interested in anything that is remotely an advert. You, if you if you are trying to push something, then you have to try and find the news angle so that that is almost a secondary thing, so that it's just happening. Um, but certainly, if you're looking at um, what stories, and not every story works for every media. So um, if you are looking at, uh, at um, you can look at if you're the first or the best in something, if you've won an award, if you have what's happening in your practice at the moment, have you got a new service? But when you're looking at a new story, how is that service going to improve the lives of your patients? Yeah. So how is that going to happen? What is the latest, um, if there are some latest guidelines or latest statistics out um, then how is that you use that and sort of comment on it, make a mm-hmm. comment on it. So that would be a way of writing, you write a press release and then um, you would send that to your local media. Mm. Um, if uh, you wanted to, if you've got, if your local radio station has a has a talk-in so, or a phone-in show, then you could offer yourself as an expert mm. uh, in talking about, you know, how people should, you know, the right ways of cleaning your teeth, whether you should use dental floss, you know, you know, the NHS versus private, you know, whether, you know, which which is better, is one better, you know, the different ways that you can, you know, get, um, mm. you know, if there's a dentist plan or something. You can talk about things like that um, for a phone in and get people to say, I've got this problem with my mm. tooth and I don't know what to do with it and I can't mm. get an NHS appointment. So you can, there are different, different options. things mm. that, that you can do and every practice will be different. And I think... Um, Sort of like the the new CQC guidelines, for instance, for, for dental practices, well, for all health, um, the, the health industry, the health sector, they're very patient centric now. Mm. Um, and so they really need to look at all their communications right across mm. the board. So they need to look at how they are uh, dealing with, you know, 
how they are talking to their patients. Is it by email? Is it by newsletter? Is it on social media? But if you can get yourself in the media, that is talking to your whole community. It's how you're also um, educating your community, the CQC want to see. Mm. So by getting yourself, finding a story that you can uh, uh, get in the media and you're the expert, you are the dentist that is the, that is putting that forward, you're going to get that um, mm. organic. Yeah, oh yeah, I know practices that do, do very well in terms of generation yeah. of new patients. And like you say, if, you, if you're seen in that capacity, and you've got good Google reviews mm -hmm. and it's meeting the requirements of CQC, mm -hmm. suddenly you're just elevating yourself to, to a nice you're building level. bricks, aren't yeah. you, to your authority. Yeah. Yeah, but exactly. also look at sort of key dates and national months and national weeks. Like mm. um, November, for instance, is um, uh, uh, Oral Cancer Awareness Month. And so, sort of from mid, um, mid May to mid June is National Smile Month. So look at what case studies, case studies mm. that you can get because journalists love case studies. So if they can talk to the actual person, so if you've got somebody who has had oral cancer or they've had a relative who has died because of oral cancer, mm. then um, then you know put that forward and you know invite invite the cameras in and say this is what mm. we're doing. We're putting on oral cancer screening. Mm. You know, get yourself you know and so that they can come in, they can talk to you in in your in your dental practice, but at the same time they can talk to someone who has had mm. oral cancer or they have had mm. uh, some a relative who has died so that they can appeal to people to get screened. Mm. Sure, yeah, yeah. So your <laughs> your segue into dentistry was through Nikki Rowland with the yes. Magic Dentist campaign, which we support through FJ we Media. Do. We're the media partner for that, that project. Yes. What, what was it about that initiative that, that drew you in, other than Nikki being utterly relentless and, and not <laughs> accepting no as an answer? But, but aside from camped that... Camped on your doorstep. <laughs> well, I've, kn I've known Nikki... For years, actually, because when I when I was when I was doing my um, I, well, I met her actually when I first set up my business. Sorry, just backtracking, and then I'll get there. <laughs> okay, go on. I um, after I had my children, I left at ITV and I set up my PR business. So I was, I, and then they asked me back. So I was being a sort of planning producer for about a year, freelance, and I was still running my business the other uh, couple of days of the week. And then it was, but it was too much because I was commuting to Leeds. I live, live over in East Yorkshire. Right. And then, um, and then they asked me back again as uh, to be a, the reporter over here again in, in sort of like Hull, East Yorkshire area. And um, so I came back two days a week and then the other three days I would do my business. So um, while I was doing all of that, um, I, I first met Nikki at a networking for my business, uh, a networking uh, event at my business. And we just hit it off. And so... When I was at Calendar, I knew that she she was when she was a practice manager, and um, so I if I needed a dentist, I would ring Nikki. Oh, right, right. To she, go there. She, so she I, was in I'd your little black book. I'd interviewed yes, <laughs> I'd interviewed Nikki previously and, and and filmed at her dental practice. Um, so then uh, and then we became friends. So um, and we actually did a, a, a piece for a, a dentist magazine for a year. I was giving her advice that she needed to follow from a PR point of view and she would implement it in her practice. So we would do like a monthly oh, call. Okay. So then um, when she um, uh, when she set up the Magic Dentist campaign, we were just sort of chatting and she just said, would you help? And I said, yes, of course. So that's just it, literally, it wasn't difficult at all because I thought it was such an amazing campaign mm, and who yeah. doesn't want to see, you know, children have better oral health? Mm. Because what shocked me though were the statistics. So the fact that the, the number that one reason for children to actually have a general anaesthetic is because of, you know, teeth yeah. extractions. It's and scary, that just it? shocked me. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that shocked me. And, I, and I'm a journalist and I thought, why didn't I already know this? It's a, it's a terrible so, stat. Absolutely yeah. terrible stat. Could, could you just explain what the, what the magic dentist is and, and what he's doing in terms of kind of help, helping with that education? Okay, yeah. So the Magic Dentist campaign, as you say, is set up by Nikki. It started because she wrote a, an amazing um, children's book and her daughter, Izzy, illustrated it all about the magic dentist. And it's, uh, it's in rhyme. So it's very um, like Dr. Zeus. So if you've read Dr. Zeus, mm -hmm. you will know exactly what I mean. Yeah. And she uses all the different, um, they, it goes through with children going to the dentist and the magic dentist, there's like a little, the tooth, if you turn it up, it's like the, the bunny and there's a tooth fairy. And it's, the idea is to um, <clears throat> show children, the yes, the importance of cleaning your teeth and how to clean your teeth because there are brushing instructions as well. But also um, 
just yeah. that it's not scary. Don't be scared mm-hmm. of going to the dentist. And, yeah. and, you know, this is really important. So, and they sort of go on adventures. So it's it's a really amazing book. So that then transferred into the into the campaign. And so Nikki goes into school. She has an actual magician who is a dentist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a dentist who is a, a member of the magic circle is the magic dentist. And so they go into schools with a dental practice and they um, have these uh, amazing workshops with uh, primary school children, teaching them how, to, and, and one of the dental nurses is the tooth fairy, and they uh, go into schools and they teach them all about oral health. They just have, and they just do magic tricks and everything. But they also go into dental practices who put on fun days uh, to do the same kind of event. And it's that that she's trying to spread the word about, and she's spreading that, um, you know, getting more schools and more dental practices mm. involved, and it's getting the word out. It's a um, great campaign. Mm. It really is. It's an amazing mm. campaign, and we've mm. had some really great PR for it. Mm. And so she's been on the um, she's been on the local news uh, mm. up here, but she's also been on BBC Breakfast News um, mm. um, with a because we we had when I'm talking about putting a story together, we actually got them to come into film at a mm. school so that right. they could. Speak to the children, speak to the teachers, speak to the dentist, speak to Nikki, and have the pictures there to actually tell the story. Um, and so, and who doesn't love, you know, lots of children, you know, yeah. doing something exciting. We can put the so, link in. So that's been amazing, really. Yeah. She's been on lots of radio stations. So um, she's had some um, amazing, and we just come, to, you know, chipping away gradually. Yeah. Yeah, Chris was just saying we will. We'll add the um, we'll add the link um to the website in the in the episode notes so that people Please can click do. and it's find out a bit, yeah. a bit more about it. In case it. our listeners want to get involved, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If, they will, if, any, if they, anybody they, does, that would be amazing. Get in touch with Nikki because if you can, um, if if you have a local school that you want to go into. Mm then you can actually use it for your own press. Mm. You know, get yourself mm. in the media that way. I was way, just thinking, we're talking about PR today yeah, and right. people are always struggling to find interesting things to talk about in their local community. Yeah. If you hosted an event in your practice with the Magic Dentist, that's a great it's way good of making, PR. It is. making and we've helped, the local news. And we've actually done that. So I've written, um, I've done press releases and got people on the on their local radio, depending on where it happened to be, whether it was in London, whether it was in Scotland, where, you know, so it's, so it is, it is, it is doable, completely mm. doable, and people are interested because use the statistics that I was saying, get mm. the statistics and the up to date statistics about children's oral health, yeah. um, and that makes it into a story because you're talking about your local community, mm. yeah, um, and yeah. how you well, are helping brilliant. them. So that's that's really. Oh, and the other thing, she's putting <coughs> educational packs together so that she can actually almost do the magic dentist uh, workshop in a box. So that she'll be able to send it, so a school mm. can put it on themselves and invite a dentist in, or the mm. dentist, the dentist, the dental practice themselves can actually go in with it, so that all the information is there, uh, and the the magician will go into. Mm. Wow, brilliant! That's good, Fiona. If you could just take one thing from your career and your your business life, what's the <laughs> the one thing you think is the most important part in terms of being in business? Um, networking. Probably be mm. well. Be a decent person for a start, so yeah. people can okay, trust yeah. you. That's yeah, really nice. important. Um, but also, uh, talking to people, networking is mm. very important because if people don't know that you're there, um, then uh, no one's going. It, it, it's that support network, isn't it? Yes. So it's that support network of other businesses. And when you set up uh, in business yourself, as I did, I, I was, I'm a journalist. I didn't know anything mm. about setting up a business. And running a business is completely different. So I'm great at what I do. Mm. So I say so myself. <laughs> but I'm really good at what I do. Um, but running a business is a completely different, yeah. Mm, uh, yeah. you know, you need a different toolkit completely. Definitely. So having, going, networking with people mm. and saying, this is what I'm doing at the moment, or I've come up against this problem. You can, you know, people are quite happy to tell mm. you, well, try mm. this, try that, or I use think it's it. a really good point. We we did a previous episode with Dr. Tilly Houston, and um, she was telling us how, so she's quite actively involved in the BACD, which is a, a dental group. And she said that um, she's got three jobs as a result of being involved in that organisation. And and she said, is that what you just said, that it's her network which has provided her with those opportunities? Mm. And they've also provided with friends and people have recommended courses to her. So I, I agree. I, I think I think networking is, mm. is really important. And I think it's networking in person in your uh, local community, but also online now because we've got, mm. you know, I do quite a bit on LinkedIn, um, yeah. but it's it's really important to do that. And then you join 
um, communities on LinkedIn or just communities on Facebook that you, if, if you join like a master, I'm in a LinkedIn mastermind. So I have a, a whole, you know, there are I don't know thousands probably of, of, of businesses who are in this mastermind with me and we all share information. Hmm. Uh, and I think if you've got an idea for something, you can put it in there and you can sort of work out whether or not it's going to work or not. Hmm. So I think that sort of network, that extended network then, hmm. people you might not have met, but you, you are, you know them you're yeah. part and you of trust it. them because yeah. they're online on, and they're in the same group as you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fiona, we've got to the time where we have two questions that we need to ask you. Um, <laughs> given <laughs> your background and the things you've done, the people you've met, I'm going to be fascinated yeah. to hear what the answer to these questions are. So our first question is, you can be a fly on the wall in a situation. Where are you and who's there? What's going on? Do you know, this has really flummoxed me because I would like to be a fly on the wall in so many different situations. <laughs> So I've, well, perhaps I, you can have a couple. We'll let you I, have a couple. I, have I might, I've, I've written the load down. I'd like to, some of them are sort of historical, really, probably. Um, and um, I'd, I'd be really interested in um, Hitler's last moments. What actually mm. happened? You okay. know, did, did he actually kill himself or did he somehow manage to escape? Because there's so much controversy over that. I'd also um, like to be a fly on the wall to find out how um, Marilyn Monroe actually died. Oh, I that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> conspiracy theorist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I really love conspiracy theories because I like to try and get to the bottom of things. <laughs> um, but, nice link. Yes. Are you going to do JFK? <laughs> well, I could have done, but then that would be, you know, I mean, you know, you'd sort of, you know, fly on the wall in the Oval Office. It depends on which president. I'm not quite sure. Really. Hoover, yeah. isn't it? Hoover, oh. I suppose, was shot him or something, are they? But um, I'm, um, I was saying that we're Irish Catholic, so mm. I'd quite like to go right back and go to the Last Supper. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, okay. and see if it's actually as portrayed in Da Vinci's yeah. painting, you know, is what actually happened and, and things like that. But I'd also, well, two more things, sorry. <laughs> no, I told we've, you, we've, I had a long we've yeah. never had anybody come up with five, just, five things. I'll tell you what, the Last Supper just made me think of Monty Python and that <laughs> sketch of the Last yeah. Supper. But anyway, let's move it on. Well, Life of Brian, I mean, that's just. That is the movie. funniest <laughs> sketch ever. That is so funny. But um, I'd like to go into NASA's control room when man worked on the moon. Because okay. that was actually in the year I was born as well. I was two oh. months old at that time. Right. And now, did they? Did they land on the moon? I'd... Oh, well. <laughs> well we've yeah, all seen the film with Elliot Gould. Oh, have Captain you ever watched a film called Wag the Dog? That is just really, if yes. you haven't, it, it's really right. good. Yes. Yeah, all about that sort of thing. Um, but finally, and this is more modern day, I'd quite like to know what um, King Charles and Prince William really think of um, what's going on with Harry and Meghan. Mm. And conversely, I'd like to be on the fly in the wall in Harry and Meghan's house to find out what, what the heck yeah. they're actually doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah that would be a very interesting one. Very yes. interesting one. Yes. Wow. Well, wow. so super we, inquisitive. Oh. Maybe that's the journalistic mind I there. You say that. Honestly, there are so many more, but I just yeah. thought, oh, this is just too difficult. I've got to stop somewhere. So I've got to stop somewhere. So our follow-up question is: <laughs> if you could meet somebody, um, and, and given that we were so generous last time, you're going to have to say just one person. There will be one this. person. So yes. you got the opportunity. You can sit down. You can have a cup of coffee, tea, beer, wine, whatever just you want. Pope. Who would you meet? No, well, I would love to meet the Pope, but I would say the Queen. You know, oh, obviously yeah. I will never be able to do that now. Mm. I've always wanted to meet, have tea with the Queen, but just one tea would not be enough because she's got, she's she has met so many interesting people. Mm. I'd like to find out about her and what she really thinks of people, but also all the people that she's met, all the presidents, all the dignitaries, mm. everyone that she's met. And um, I, I think she would have been... I think I'd have needed a fortnight with her, really, yeah. to get all yeah. the information. But I think she would have just been, and I think she'd have been loads of fun. Yeah, yeah. I think she would have been. I think she would have been. I think so she did. That's um, who I would love to. An incredible have job. Mm. An incredible yeah. job, uh, yeah. and not an easy one because, uh, you know, I, I'm, lots of people have watched the program The Crown, and I get that that's dramatization. But it brought it home to me just how they are a family in the traditional sense. And they mm. also have a job as the royal family, but mm. they're the same people. Mm-mm. And it's mm. not easy to kind of manage that. Go back to your point about, you know, Charles, William and, and Harry. You know, they are, you know, it's father and sons and siblings. But they're in the media. Yeah. You know, goes into hospital, boom, yeah. tff, they, they, front they, page they, news. they also have another role as well. So it's not, it's not straightforward. But I agree, I think the Queen would have been a hoot. 
I think she'd have been great fun. She, I reckon she'd have been quite naughty. I don't yeah. mean like naughty, naughty, but I mean, you know, just like quite a bit cheeky. So cheeky, yeah. I yeah. agree. I think it would have been hilarious. I mean, when you think about, you know, she was always like having tea with Paddington and stuff like that. Yes. And, yeah. and I yeah. loved and when she like jumped out, you know, for the Olympics. Was it Olympics? Yes. And then she yeah, jumped was, out yeah. and played, you know, with James Bond. Yeah. You know, yeah. all of that, I think it, uh, it would have been amazing. Brilliant. Fiona, it's been a joy. It's been an absolute joy. It's been um, brilliant. I think your your history in terms of the work you've done is great. I think getting involved with Nikki and the Magic Dentist campaign is brilliant. Great, yeah, brilliant. Um, and we'll definitely put those links in the in the episode. But no, we appreciate your time today. It's been wonderful talking. It's been Thank fascinating. You so much different for different side me. of stuff. No, Thank not you so at all. much. Not at all. Look after yourself. Speak to you soon. Bye. Yes, you too. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dentology, where we discuss the business of dentistry. If you like what you heard, please do subscribe where you found this episode. That would be amazing. And also follow us on Instagram.